Welcome to Reimagining the Ballet des Porcelains, a story of magic, desire, and exotic entanglement. I'm Jennifer Homans. I'm the founder and director of the Center for Ballet and the Arts. And I'm really pleased to welcome you here tonight to hear a program that originated uh, at the Center. The Center exists to inspire new ideas and new ballets and to help us expand the way we think about the art forms, history and practice. So this program is really um, uh, one that I'm especially happy to bring to you. Um, we uh, have other programs and our mission and all of that. You can find information, anything you, you want in the chat. Um, so I'm not gonna take up time with that. Um, this program will be bringing you CBA fellow and an associate professor of art history at NYU, Meredith Martin, who has worked with Phil Chan uh, of Final Bow for Yellowface, the co-founder. Um, and they have restaged this ballet that, that Meredith discovered in an archive. And they're going to tell you about that. Um, again, their bios are also in the chat because I don't wanna take up their time um, enumerating their uh, accomp accomplishments, which you can read about uh, more easily in the chat. Uh, Meredith and Phil are joined tonight by Martha Graham principal dancer Yin Shin and Broadway actor, singer, dancer, and choreographer Tyler Haynes. So Meredith and Phil are going to kind of lead the way and they're going to discuss their collaboration, show a short video of the work, um, and at the end of the discussion we'll take some questions, we'll have a little bit of time. So please uh, click the Q&A button to ask your questions. Um, and if you need tech help in any way, um, you can privately message the host, Christian, uh, from the CBA staff in the chat and she'll do her very best, of course, to, to help you out. So I just wanna say a warm thank you to all of the artists and to the CBA team who've helped make this happen and also to all of you for being here. And now I turn things over to Meredith and Phil, and we begin. Yes, hello, welcome everyone. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you, Jennifer, for your introduction and thanks so much to the CBA um, for having us here tonight, yes, and for supporting us every step of the way. Um, it's been really wonderful to work with all of you. Um, I'm going to give a brief kind of rundown of the program and then get started. Um, so I will begin uh, with a very brief introduction, uh, telling you about the project, the origins, and the inspiration. And then I will turn things over to Phil, who will walk you through all the various stages of his creative process and his collaboration with the many artists who've been involved. Um, we'll also hear briefly from uh, Shen Ying and also Tyler Haynes, who've joined us tonight, who are two of our dancers. Um, and Shen has also been serving as our assistant choreographer. Um, and then we will open it up for, for questions. Um, so I'm going to start off and share my screen. Let's see. So can everyone see that? Phil, can you give me a thumbs up? I can see you on, okay, great. So I have our, our title slide here um, with a wonderful sketch with our costume designer, Harriet Young, another former CBA fellow um, for a musician's robe. And I'll come back to some of Harriet's designs in just a moment. OK, um, so as Jennifer mentioned, I'm an art historian. I'm an interloper in the dance world. Um, and I focus on 18th century French art and architecture. And I also work on French interactions with Asia during that time period. So. I write a lot about objects, artworks, um, as well as people and ideas and technologies that moved back and forth between France and Asia. And that means that I write a lot about porcelain, which was a, a material, a kind of quasi-magical substance in the 18th century, highly prized among Europeans who um, referred to it as white gold and who tried for centuries to figure out how to make it or to sort of steal the technology from, uh, from China um, and also highly prized in, in East Asia, of course, um, as well. And it, uh, porcelain in the time period, it's sort of difficult sometimes to explain to contemporary audiences that it was a really sexy material. It had a kind of magical associations, a sort of mystical quality that I think is sometimes lost on um, contemporary museum goers. Um, and so I try to bring in some of that, um, that magic and mystery in my own um, writing and speaking and, and, and research on porcelain. 
I also have a side interest in um, working with, collaborating with, and writing about uh, the work of contemporary artists who attempt to reimagine the past and, and make it relevant for the present. Um, and these two interests, my historical interest and my interest in contemporary art, kind of converged in this exhibition for which I'm showing you this, this installation view um, that took place at the Frick Collection a few years ago. Um, and it was an exhibition devoted to the work of Arlene Sheckett, a contemporary sculptor who'd had a, a, a fellowship at the Meissen porcelain manufactory outside of Dresden, which was the first European manufactory to kind of finally figure out the secrets for making true or, or hard paste porcelain. Um, and they figured this out around 1710. Arlene worked with the manufactory for a number of years, and she made a whole body of work that didn't replicate, but kind of responded to and creatively reimagined 18th century porcelain. And the Frick showed her work alongside examples of actual 18th century Meissen porcelain um, that was in the collection of, of Henry Arnold. And in fact, the Arnold family and Henry Arnold's daughter-in-law, Jody Arnold, have been also big supporters of our, of our project. Um, have been wonderfully um, enthusiastic throughout. In any event, one of the things that I liked about Arlene's show is that she did kind of tap into some of the, the magic, the kind of creative whimsy, the sexiness of porcelain, um, and also at the same time capturing certain ideas about it at the time period, a sense of kind of impending animation, which I think you can see from her, her piece on the right. And I was, really, I was really inspired by her installation. And I wanted to try to figure out a way, you know, as a, as a scholar, as an art historian, to, to also convey, um, convey that sense. But you know, I'm not an artist. Um, and, you know, I wanted to do something that was break the mold and do something that was a little bit different from, from just uh, writing. And I had heard actually from um, a good friend of mine, Esther Bell, who's now a curator at the Clark Museum, about a, a very kind of little known um, lost, uh, a libretto for a lost ballet that she had come across. So actually I shouldn't, I shouldn't take credit for finding it. Esther found it and she told me about it when she was researching her dissertation, her dissertation in the National Library in Paris. Um, this small little 15-minute divertissement written by the Comte de Caylus, uh, who's better known as a kind of French antiquarian and scholar, not a librettist, um, but a ballet with, with music by another not very well-known composer called Conval, but with a beautiful kind of simple Baroque score. Um, and the title of the, of the piece, it's known as the Ballet de Porcelaine and also as Le Prince Podaté, or the, the Teapot Prince. Um, and Esther had told me, you know, you should go and, and look this up and, you know, I think this would be really interesting for your work. And I read the description of, of the ballet and it starts off with dancers, you know, turning around until they, spinning around until they transform into porcelain vases. And I was just so struck by this image and wanting myself to somehow try to bring this to life, but not quite knowing how to, how to do it. And, you know, for years, a few years, I would kind of walk around and tell people about this, this image and, and this desire. and, and wanting to think about doing it at some point. So I applied for a fellowship at, at the CBA. And through um, the CBA, I met with you know, a, whole, a whole range of um, different artists, Catherine Petrosi from the New York Baroque Dance Company, who was very um, helpful in sort of um, tossing around ideas with me and sharing her own expertise, um, Harriet Young, um, Sarah Foster Sproul, who was one of my co-fellows, um, Marina Harris, a number of different fellows who kind of helped me along the way. Um, and then through the CBA, I also met Phil Chan, and you know, the instant I, I met him and heard about his work through Final Bow, it became immediately apparent. You know, this is um, this is the partnership, the collaboration I want to have. This is the person that I want to work with to try to try to bring this work to life. Um, so let me just explain briefly how that how that came about. So the ballet, as I mentioned, it's a very short 15-minute work. Um, it's inspired by a fairy tale from the time period. It was only performed twice at a chateau. Um, an aristocratic chateau on the outskirts of Paris, once in 1739 and then again in 1741, and not since. Um, and we know the 1741 performance took place outside in the gardens of the chateau with a water feature that was surrounded by porcelain vases um, and a kind of lit archway with a teapot in the center um, and the dancers in, in front of it. And so this festival print that you see, this evening festival print of, a, of an earlier uh, royal party at Versailles gives you a kind of sense of, of what that would have looked like. Um, and otherwise, um, we know just a little bit of the bare bones description of the libretto. We know about the story. Um, the story is, um, it's the tale of a Chinese sorcerer who rules this blue island or this island of porcelain. And he's turned all of the inhabitants into porcelain. And this prince and princess have to find him. The prince gets disoriented, and he's turned into a teapot. 
the princess has to seduce the sorcerer, steal his wand, break the spell, and bring everyone back to life. And it's this kind of standard fairy tale love story, a sort of orientalist fairy tale that was very popular at the time. But Phil and I also read it as a kind of allegory for the intense European desire to sort of know and to, to steal the secrets of, of porcelain manufacture. So that was kind of our starting point. We know a little bit about the staging. We have the score. We have this libretto. But otherwise, nothing survives. Um, no costumes, no set. Um, we have to really kind of reimagine it. And it's a challenge, but it also gives us this, this real opportunity for kind of remixing. Um, and creating it, you know, creating something new out of it. We have some visual inspirations, like this 18th century print of a porcelain worker from a whole series of images of craftspeople sort of turning into the, the objects, the tools of their trade. And the libretto describes actually servants of the house. Um, it was a chateau owned by the, the Comte de Morville, who was the French foreign minister and who was directly responsible for trade between um, France and, and Asia. He had his servants of the house dress up in porcelain costumes, wear these kind of like 18th century cardboard sandwich boards almost, and, and kind of walk across the stage um, performing as, as porcelain. So these kinds of images give us inspiration for that, although we're not having a chorus, we're not having a kind of you know, servants of the house situation. We're going to costume our musicians instead, which, which Phil can talk a bit about. Um, and then we have other kinds of visuals, like the family of the Comte de Morville commissioned the artist Watteau to design this cabinet chinois, so Chinese cabinet, for another one of their estates. So some other kind of images that, that give us inspiration. Um, none of the choreography survives. Um, as many of you attending tonight probably know, er, some early Baroque dances, especially noble courtly dances, um, were notated according to this Beauchamp foyer, this beautiful Beauchamp foyer notational system. But these other kind of more casual divertissement ballet pantomimes were, were not notated, and this one was not. So we have to, you know, Phil really um, brilliantly kind of reimagined this, um, the choreography for this work. We have some sense um, in the original fairy tale that inspired the ballet. The Chinese sorcerer at the end, once he's kind of defeated by the prince and princess, he himself gets transformed or turned into a, a pagode which is a French term for a kind of Chinese or Chinese-style porcelain figurine, um, like the one you see on the screen. And pagodes were kind of regular characters in French masquerades at the time. And this costume, this costume design by Jean Berrin, who worked for Louis XIV's court, has an accompanying description that explains how the dancer would have moved, that in fact the legs that you see crossed are fake, and the dancer's legs fit inside the pedestal, attached by a kind of suspenders, and he would sort of hop up and down and perform in this kind of parodic burlesque mode that's really different from the more sort of fluid, symmetrical, classical dances that you see inscribed with this Beauchamp foyer notation. Um, these pagode figures are related to this influx of um, both you know, Chinese porcelain pagodes and then European imitations of these figures um, that began to be produced and consumed throughout the 18th century. Um, and the European examples make these figures you know, even more kind of parodic in a sense with their sort of the grins, um, the makeup. Uh, sometimes also they would be outfitted with movable or removable heads, tongues, or hands, um, which adds to their kind of doll-like ornamental effect and also, of course, creates a kind of um, racialized stereotype that also gets constructed over dance and performance throughout the 18th century. So this was something that we wanted to confront, you know, rather than, you know, this is a work that has some very problematic racialized association in terms of how it presents Asian characters um, versus, you know, sort of European dancers. Um, but instead of, you know, kind of, um, not performing it or canceling a work like this. Um, I think you know Phil can talk a lot more about how a lot of his work, his activist work through Final Bow, is devoted to thinking about how we can um, we can retain these these works, but you know give them a new um, uh, put a new spin on them, reimagine them in a way that makes them relevant and meaningful for contemporary audiences, for multiracial audiences. And I'll just briefly say one of the ways that we did that is through casting. We've turned our um, Chinese sorcerer into a kind of mad European porcelain collector, like Augustus the Strong, who was the founder of the Meissen Manufactory. And we have Tyler Haynes, who you see here in this photo on the left, and who you'll hear from in, a little bit later in the presentation. Um, he's dancing that role. 
And we have two Asian American soloists from the New York City Ballet, Daniel Applebaum and Georgina Paskogan, who are going to serve as our, our prince and princess. And then Jin Ying has also been working with us. She will take on the role of the princess next fall. Um, and she's been working with Phil too with, with the choreography as well. Um, we've had Harriet Young design our costumes, and Phil can tell you more about that, but she's come up with a kind of wonderful, um, inspired by, but also sort of moving beyond, you know, porcelain prototypes um, and creating these. And she has a lot of a challenge of different looks, you know, the kind of pre-transformation, post-transformation, as well as costuming our, our musicians. Um, we've also had the, the pleasure of working with another um, former CBA fellow, Patricia Beeman, who's been serving as our Baroque dance consultant and who's been really helpful in um, showing us different you know, arm movements and, and, and choreography and so on. Um, and then finally, I, I just wanted to bring in these two objects. We've been inspired a lot by both historical artworks, porcelain, as well as um, contemporary art. And these are two, this is a 15th century bowl and then a, another contemporary piece by a Korean artist, uh, Yi So Kung, which um, both uh, rely on or, or represent the Japanese restoration technique of kintsuki, um, which is the idea of when a porcelain piece is, is broken or shattered, you repair it um, with, a, in this case, a little a porcelain shard, but also with a kind of gold infill or lacquer. Um, and I think, you know, this is, was really Phil's, Phil's idea from the outset, but Kintsuki for us serves as a kind of metaphor for this project. This ballet comes to us in fragments. You know, this is a historical work that um, is, is fragmented. We're trying to kind of bling it up, fill it in with a little bit of gold, but also thinking about that idea of, of repair, you know, how we can, we can use this work and, and to kind of rethink it in this meaningful way. Um, and the work of the scholar Anne Chang has also been really um, important and influential for us, um, her, her essay and her book on ornamentalism and this question of, you know, what, what beauty might look like in a broken world. And I think Phil's um, beautiful choreography and work, for me, really um, demonstrates that. And I will turn it to him. I just wanted to briefly tell you, you'll see in the program our different, our production schedule and our, our performance schedule and all of the different venues that we're, we're going to, including the Met, the galleries at the Met Museum in conjunction with a show on inspiring Walt Disney that opens on December 6th. Or our ballet will be performed there on December 6th. We will be going to Europe next summer for a tour um, and performing at Wadston Manor, at the Royal Pavilion at Brighton, um, in Naples, in Venice at the Palazzo Grassi, um, and in the 19th century porcelain factory buildings at Sevres outside of Paris. And we can definitely talk more about um, that that schedule and those different venues and the kind of site specificity of that, if you'd like, during the Q&A. So I will now turn it over to Phil. Thank you, Meredith. That was great. Um, I'm, I'm, every time I, I talk to Meredith, I fall a little bit more in love with porcelain. She's definitely gotten me um, the, the porcelain sickness. So uh, yeah, when, when Meredith approached me about this, this ballet, you know, she was telling me about the, the plot of this this fairy tale, which is basically this, you know, Chinese magician who lives on a blue island of porcelain and sort of turns people into frozen porcelain statues, any trespassers who come through. And then this prince who comes and is captured by the, the magician, and then a, a princess who's uh, his lover, uh, the prince's lover comes to, to save him and she uh, seduces the magician and she steals his magic wand and frees all the inhabitants of the island and then turns the magician into this pagod, this bobblehead, which incidentally is, um, you know, when Meredith and I were walking through the Met Museum, we're looking at them and they have detached heads and hands that are on springs. So very much um, sort of like a, you know, if you think of those pagods as like Barbie dolls of the day, like people just had them around, um, that would have been a, a symbol that would have informed Chineseness in terms of performance. And so we see that in so many nutcrackers um, across the world today. So even um, some of these racial caricatures have existed through time. So being able to draw some of those um, historic connections in collaboration with Meredith has been really um, kind of an amazing experience, both for this project and for my own um, scholarship as well. So um, when Meredith approached me, um, you know, really the, the sort of situation with our work with Final Bow, um, 
you know, for those of you who are not familiar, uh, my co-founder Georgina Paskogan, who's a soloist at New York City Ballet, and I founded it uh, five years ago. Uh, if you go to yellowface.org, you can see more information about it. But essentially, we have asked ballet companies to question how they portray Asians on our stages, um, especially uh, in light of what is happening to Asian folks uh, in, in America right now and, and around the world. Um, you know, this this really has hit home in a much closer way over the last couple of years, um, just seeing the uptick in anti-Asian violence, um, even experiencing it myself, um, being spat on, um, being assaulted just a couple of weeks ago <laughs> in an elevator. Um, you know, my father, who's an elderly Chinese man, being, um, you know, too scared to leave the house. And so that was all in my emotional palette um, when Meredith approached me about this story. And it just seemed like um, just questioning why would we re, why would, what would we get out of reviving this, this ballet? And would there be another way to reimagine this work for a contemporary audience, for a multiracial audience um, in the hands of Asian folks right now? What would that actually look like? So even just um, for those of you who are, you know, dance dorks like, you know, like the rest of us, um, thinking about reconstruction versus reimagination. Um, you know, there's a couple different approaches when we look at historic works. Um, in this case, we didn't have um, the dance notation. We just had a libretto and we had music and just sort of some notes. Um, so in this case, you could either try to recreate a dance exactly as it would have appeared at that time. Um, I detail that, that process and also some of the challenging implications of that um, in my, my book, Final Bow for Yellow Face, um, where I, I, I worked with uh, Ballet West on the revival of uh, George Balanchine's 1925 Le Chant de Rossignol, which was actually done in literal yellow face. And so the tension between preserving history, we need to see history, blemishes and all performed as is, versus saying, hey, this is an entertainment on, you know, uh, ballet's greatest hits, you know, why are we doing this in yellow face for a multiracial audience? So how do we balance tradition um, and being able to look at tradition with maybe another way? How do we reimagine a work for today within the confines of, of the rules that we have been given? So very much our approach is sort of taking the second route. Um, so I really, it was really important to me to collaborate with other Asian American artists um, because I felt like only with that group um, could we navigate some of the cultural issues, some of the images, some of the symbols in, in the water about being Asian that um, has been projected onto us, but in, in some ways this project we could kind of reclaim. So figuring out a way to almost flip the script with this story. So in our version of, of the, the story, um, we have a, a sort of a racialized European collector, um, as Meredith said, very much uh, sort of modeled after Augustus the Strong and sort of somebody who collects things and people, it's very much like this, this allegory of this Chinese magician on an island with different frozen people that he's collected. And then this, this duality, especially with porcelain and, and being Chinese, um, just being compared to a China doll or, or dolls and inanimate objects. There's a long history of us associating Asians with, with objects. Um, and so how do we break free from some of those stereotypes, some, from some of those unconscious programming that we all have um, to say like, hey, we're, we're not China dolls. We're actually people with nuance. We, we, you know, we have real sensitive feelings. We're your neighbors and friends and colleagues and um, we're human. Um, and so just figuring out how to use this story as, a, as um, to highlight that side of the story. Um, if we played the prince and princess as being racialized as, as Chinese or Asian. Um, and so even my own history, um, so just to, to say that I had very minimal awareness of porcelain as a commodity, it was just sort of like the list of things that was, you know, crisscrossed the Silk Road, you know, there's silks and spices and porcelain, you know. Um, but then after working with Meredith and really diving deeper and deeper into the porcelain, the history of it, um, how Europe discovered had the secrets of making Chinese porcelain. I mean, it's it's literally like a, a Silicon Valley thriller, like just the, the amount of um, 
entrepreneurial es espionage and intrigue around this, but um, all centered around this strong desire for this exoticness, this otherness, this magical substance, which was both strong and also delicate, you know, this sort of paradoxical magical thing. Um, my own hometown of Hong Kong, where I'm from, um, was greatly shaped by the history of porcelain, right? Because when um, Europe, um, to, to figure out this trade imbalance with China, you know, they're, they're bankrupting themselves with, with trying to buy all this porcelain. The only way to get some of their own back was to flood China with opium and get them hooked on opium. So uh, then the opium wars, as a result of that, uh, they had to cede Hong Kong um, as a colony to to the UK, which is where I'm from. <laughs> so, you know, even my own personal history is deeply tied to the history of porcelain. And I had very minimal awareness of this until this project. So it's, it's deep in my own um, personal history as well. But um, I wanted to share some of the process of how we reimagine this work. Um, so first, just looking at costuming, um, I immediately knew that I had to work with Harriet Young, who does a lot of ballet costumes for New York City Ballet, for Justin Peck. Um, she's worked with me before in costumes. So uh, I, I reached out to her because uh, actually, honestly, we were, we were at uh, a ballet gala and we were just talking about just the experience of being Asian in this primarily white space and the frustrations and challenges. And even just connecting with her on that level, I knew that she would really see these characters um, and see this dynamic in a way that uh, I think would be generative and, and, and inspire her. And, and she would really be able to, to chew on that idea. So, so that's why um, in our initial discussions with Harriet, um, we talked about how you know, Europeans viewed Asians, what were some of the, the fantasy depictions out there, but also the other way, what were some of, uh, you know, China's depictions of Europeans? And so Meredith, again, being this incredible knowledge of, of history, you know, was sending us photos of the Chinese emperor in, in sort of European dress up with this, you know, Louis the 14th wig and stuff. So, you know, just funny, um, just making a space to talk about culture and talk about the history and, and talk about the complicated uh, mixing uh, of, of culture. And I think um, just talking to Harriet and, and wanting a contemporary approach with both the choreography, it made sense that she wasn't going to try and create period costumes, but instead was going to be um, using porcelain and using the history as a jumping point. So Meredith can, has some, some great slides here that go back to, to see some of those, those sketches, but we see that the color palette that Harriet has chosen is um, from, you know, very much recognizable that I think this, the, the flower print on the princess's uh, gown is, is from a mice and teapot. Um, this sort of transformed uh, prince who is partially human, you, you see his flesh, you see his humanity, but also he's frozen in this sort of pristine, beautiful, uh, ornamental um, Rococo leotard. And then this, this costume for the, the musicians um, who wear these sort of Chinese you know, porcelain robes. Uh, in the original libretto, there were instructions to have the servants who had, as Meredith referenced, these sort of cut out cardboard porcelain costumes. Um, instead of trying to create a porcelain set and, and, and try to you know, make a build, build a grand spectacle, we just thought we would use our, mus our musicians who uh, were often depicted uh, in porcelain as objects anyway, as sort of this living, breathing set that could be part of the, the production, especially since we're performing it in a lot of different, um, different interesting venues. So it really including the, the musicians as part of the visual um, picturing of it. Um, in terms of looking at the score, um, we have a, a fantastic music uh, a director, Dong Suk Shin, who, who's a harpsichordist who actually tunes all the harpsichords at the Met. Um, and he was able to play a reduction of, um, of this, this score and then fill it out with later on with some violin and some other instruments. Um, so really starting to listen to the score, looking at the libretto, um, seeing where we can start to tie in musically um, some of the storytelling. Um, but I also knew that there were parts of the story, there were repeats to the music that felt like um, they were ornamental and they didn't really push the story along. And there were, there were other parts of the, the, the fairy tale where I thought 
Um, there's a lot of things that were gestural or cues that, that, a, that an audience at that time would have gotten in their small literary group, but that for a contemporary audience, we needed to flesh out a little bit just to make more of a story. Um, so knew that musically we needed just a little bit of newness. So uh, I reached out to um, another composer, Asian American composer, friend of mine, uh, Sugar Vendel, who uh, I love working with her because she has a strong um, sort of classical, Western classical background. Um, we were also giggling together last week about how much she loves playing Bach and stuff, you know, and how both similar uh, this process was to, to playing with some of that, that music. But, um, you know, she also is a, a new music composer. She's forward thinking, she's, she's not afraid to, um, you know, kind of push the boundaries so, so I called her and I said, hey, hey, Sugar, I'm, I'm looking to do this ballet. I need a little bit of music in between places. Um, wondering if you could make some, you know, a little bit of extra ballet score to the sound of porcelain being, you know, tapped, scraped, scratched, you know, struck, smashed. Um, and she, you know, was like, absolutely. That sounds perfect. I can absolutely work with that, you know, so no hesitation. So that was, was really lovely. And um, you know, so, so we have uh, some music clips. We're gonna show you uh, a little bit of her process of just, you know, smashing things. Um, this was a little bit of video that she captured during her own audio capture in the studio, which was the, the basis of her sampling audio in order to create the score. So here's just a little video. Okay, thank you, Meredith. I mean, it's, it's, it's not particularly thrilling television, but uh, it, it was gave us a lot of good material to work with. So here's the opening processional that she's created for the ballet. This is just a little snippet. We don't wanna give it all away, but this is just sort of a little opening section for um, the entrance of the uh, musicians and then the opening uh, duet for the dancers. Just, just to give you an idea of what she's playing with, and then that will be woven into the Baroque score, which we'll also hear some of when we see some dancing. Um, so moving along, uh, it actually came time to go in the studio and make some dances. So uh, first, I'm, I really wanted to absorb as much of the Baroque style as I could. So uh, working with Patricia uh, Beeman, um, who Meredith already introduced, um, we were actually on Zoom, this was at the height of the pandemic, maybe this was uh, January of 2021. Um, uh, and we were we were sort of talking over Zoom and she was trying to demonstrate some things to me and I was trying to do it mirrored over Zoom and, and you know, we were both trying to figure it out and she said, you know what? Um, are, you, are you around? Do you want to just meet me outside? It was like January, probably like, I don't know, low 30s. Uh, and we met in downtown Brooklyn, right on the waterfront where the carousel was, um, outdoors, socially distant. And she gave me a full Baroque uh, dance class outside in, you know, in the, in the, in the chill. <laughs> um, she, she brought along some notes. We, we looked at the notation. We looked at all of the floor patterns. We looked at, um, uh, she actually was starting to teach me notations. And then I was, you know, reading it along sort of like, you know, um, you know, really like learning a, a new language, but um, just really trying to play with 
uh, the, the style. And, and again, giving me lots of, of books to read. Again, shout out to Catherine Tarosi, you know, lovely, uh, you know, having those resources um, out there. Um, and, and yeah, so just really wanted to use that just as a, as a starting point, but really using that as a springboard to see what else we could say with that. One thing that I did want to capture in terms of the style was really a more um, inward, more restrained approach to the movement. A lot of ballet is reaching beyond, uh, sort of reaching out to the extremities, whereas the Baroque dance is much more, as Catherine talks about, inside this bubble. So, you know, really trying to um, stay inside the body, which um, for me as somebody with classical training, just it feels like... Um, you, you're trying to rev up this motor, but you have to keep it very restrained and sort of corseted and, and, and inside. So inside it feels very like hot, but you have to keep it lower, keep it calmer, keep it more, um, I don't know, like moving through water, thicker than water feeling. Um, so so that's that that's kind of what I wanted to to take from from the the style and of course the footwork. And, and so uh, wanted to share a little bit of of the solo of this is the the solo that the princess uh, comes in on, and it, it's a sarabande um, for for a, a female dancer. And I wanted to incorporate my own um, Chinese heritage using a fan. I thought that was a, a good symbol of femininity and, and an object that um, the magician could later possess. Um, but also there was a, both a, a strong history in Baroque dance of fan using using the fan, um, but also in Chinese dance. So there's a little a little bit of Chinese dance, upper body, a little bit of Baroque footwork, timing, musicality. Um, so it's a, a hybrid of a little bit of both, um, but it's in this scene, the princess is coming from a distance. Uh, her, perhaps it, she's still in her wedding dress. Uh, her lover um, was, was stolen from her and she's searching the world to find the man she loves. So um, here's the, uh, the solo for the princess. Great. And I just wanted to bring in um, Xin Ying, who is our, our princess. She was our assistant choreographer on the project. Um, I also created the role of the princess on her. Um, so it was lovely getting to work with such a, a beautiful instrument in the studio. Um, if you just wouldn't mind sharing some of your experience with this process and also as somebody, especially who also trained in Chinese dance. Hi everyone, it's such an honor to be here and it's such an honor to be involved in this, in this project as well. Um, it is very unique experience to kind of recall my Chinese classical training. I came to US for modern dance, so kind of left the, the Chinese classical dance training behind. And this is a project actually made me go into my closet, dig out my fan, you know, really started doing it again. And um, make me actually appreciate more because I remember when teacher teaching me Chinese classic dance and I felt like, oh, so frustrated sometimes. Just like, 
I want to do something else. That's why I left. And now looking back, I really appreciate the beauty in it. And um, thank you for this whole experience for Phil to bring me back in this kind of beautiful memory in a way. And I realized how hard it can be for the wrist, you know, all the wrist work, all the hand work. It took years of training to make things look smooth and delicate. And uh, that actually all showed in the work as well. Thank you for that. Of course, thank you. Um, I also wanted to introduce Tyler Haynes um, before we, we show a little bit of the pantomime. Um, we, uh, there was, there was, you know, obviously in, both in ballet and in Baroque dance, there's a lot of pantomime of storytelling. And so that's why it's been really great to work with, with Tyler, who, you know, is a Broadway guy too, and, and has a lot of experience there. So really um, just finding a new way of, of relating and telling stories and he gets really into it. So it's really great working with him. Um, and, and so, you know, one of the questions that I was thinking about in the pantomime too um, is, how can we use this old way of telling stories to, um, you know, be alive today, right? Like, so when we're watching, like, so you think you can dance, you know, it's not like, oh, you know, it's like Dancing with the Stars, it's Baroque week, you know, here's Kellyanne Conway doing the ritornelle, like that's not a thing, right? It's, but how can we use that vocabulary to say something today? Um, so really working with Tyler, um, who plays the magician, who kind of plays this villain character, um, we can talk a little bit about, um, you know, that, that process as well. Hi, <laughs> am I on? Is it time? Okay, apparently. Hi there. Um, first off, it, it is such a honor and pleasure for me to be a part of this. Um, and when Phil first talked to me about it, I, um, for me, I've danced my whole life, but I haven't um, done anything like this since I was a kid. I'm from Georgia. And so the last time I did any sort of pantomime was in their nutcracker because they did Balanchine's version of it. So it's been a good long time. But uh, for me, um, just what I'm being exposed to both culturally, both with the different styles uh, through Phil, through Patricia, through Meredith, through everyone has been um, such an education and, and an education <laughs> and, um, and a challenge. And that's the thing too with, um, uh, Phil's over there acting like a cat because I've played a cat before, but it's it's not nearly as um, difficult as uh, the Baroque style. And um, that is something I've never done. And I think, uh, Phil, you hit the nail on the head with it. it it's such an internal, uh, it's more internal. And um, I don't know, It's it's been uh, fascinating. I have a different process coming from the Broadway world. and um, And so I think having to adjust and absorb uh, what's happening in the room and also um, just kind of dive into it has been a lot of fun and a challenge within itself. But the main thing is like, I mean, we're, we have a good time and that's that's what's important to me. This this work that we're creating, that Phil's created, that's, that is happening in the room. Um, it's a joy to do and experience with each other. And that's something as I get older, as a performer, as a human, that's what I want. And that's what attracts me. And so, um, and just learning, just learning um, everything that they have presented me with. And so it's been fun and hard, um, but yeah. Thank you, Tyler. <laughs> I mean, Thank you. <laughs> um, so, so I think we're going to show, uh, you know, before we go, go into Q&A, we just want to show a little excerpt of, um, there's a little pantomime parada. This will be scored uh, differently. Um, so we have a new piece of music by Sugar for this. Um, but it's essentially the, uh, the moment when the princess meets uh, the prince who's been, you know, frozen in porcelain. And she's realizing, you know, she goes to kiss him and realizes that that, that doesn't break the spell. And so it's her process of saying goodbye. So, you know, maybe those of you who, who've lost a loved one, you know, just going to see them one last time and, and holding their hand and um, touching their hair and, and just um, making a physical memory of, of him before she has to leave him on this island. So it's, it's both saying goodbye and finding a, a tenderness there. And then in, in dancing with him, he, he comes to life again. So this is a, 
uh, Xin Ying and Daniel Applebaum um, doing uh, a duet from the from the piece. Thank you. That was that's not the music it's going to be. That's just they wanted something in the background to get them juiced up. So, um, yeah, thank you so much for for uh, listening. Uh, happy to answer any questions for Meredith, for Shin, for Tyler. Hello. I'm Andrea Salvatore, and I'm the associate director here at the Center for Ballet and the Arts, and I get to ask the questions. So if you have some questions, please add those to the Q&A. If we don't get your question during our live event, we will be sure to take note of it, and we will get back to you with an answer when we can. Um, the first question is about the future of the piece. You mentioned that you will be performing this at the Met. So if you could give us some information about that performance and um, the world tour that is coming after that production. 
Um, so thank you. I can, I'll speak briefly about our performance schedule and then Phil, I don't know if you want to talk a bit about Afterlife. Um, we are performing in the Petrie Court, in the galleries of the Met. Um, it's going to be a kind of VIP event for an exhibition they're doing called Inspiring Walt Disney, which is about the influence of 18th century decorative arts on early Disney animation and set design. And um, the Met curator Wolf Burchard, who's also a good friend, who's also been a big enthusiastic supporter of this project, has curated that exhibition. And so he um, was instrumental in getting us there to perform as their kind of um, opening night divertissement entertainment. But we're also going to have a public performance um, of the ballet in the, in the galleries of the Met at noon on that day, which is Monday, December 6th. So mark your calendars, noon. Monday, December 6th, you only have to have museum, you know, a ticket uh, to the mat to be able to attend the performance. Um, so, and then afterwards, we're going to a number of different venues in the US and Europe to University of Chicago and, and Judith Zeitlin uh, is a wonderful professor and scholar of East Asian literature and performance, um, a specialist in Chinese opera and who may be in the crowd um, tonight, but has also been really key in bringing it there um, at Princeton University, Simon Morrison, Wendy Heller on the music department have also been big supporters. And then we go to Europe. So Wadston Royal Pavilion at Brighton where we'll be performing in the Chinoiserie Music Room. So that'll be kind of wild. Uh, the Capodimonte at Naples where we're probably going to perform outside in the Bosco. Um, and they have also been huge key um, supporters from the beginning in Venice during the Biennale, but at the Palazzo Grassi, um, and then at Sev, um, outside of Paris. And Charlotte Vignon, who's the director there, has been has been helpful. And then after, um, Phil, do you want to take that? Yeah, so we're, we're uh, talking right now to uh, a company that is interested in taking the ballet on uh, after our summer tour. Um, it's in a community that has a large uh, Asian population, and they're interested in using this work as a way to reach students with dance. So using this as, since it's built in a way that's modular so that we can perform it in all these venues. So sometimes it's proscenium, sometimes it's audience on two sides, sometimes it's audience on three sides, sometimes it's audience in the round, sometimes it's in a garden. So I really made it so that it can be <clears throat> shift directionally and, and move around a lot. So. Um, which can also work in school gyms and as a way to be a flexible work. So um, just finding a way to have this work have a future beyond um, just this particular run. And also we're uh, talking about uh, making a short art film of it so it can live on for future porcelain related um, uh, exhibitions, which there are quite a few planned in the coming years. Um, I, I, again, I, I'm, joining this whole new world of of porcelain, underground porcelain fanatics. Um, thanks, Meredith. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> uh, the tour is also listed in the program that is in the chat. So if you would like to know more about where this work is going, there is a list of tour dates in that document. And so now onto a question about the work. Are there animal characters in your recreation of the ballet? One of our attendees once. Um, there are no a animal recreations in the ballet. However, Meredith has a lot of stories about porcelain animals, the racialization of animals, including monkeys and um, elephants and um, mostly mon Chinese monkeys. We, we talked a lot about Chinese monkeys, Meredith and I, but there are no animals, uh, no animals were harmed in the production of this ballet and no animals are present in the ballet either. Um, no, in case, in case that stoked a lot of curiosity that one of the alternate uh, French terms for these pagode figures is a magot. And that's also a word for a monkey, actually, specifically a, a Barbary Coast, a North African monkey. And there's a whole, um, phenomenon of uh, saint jerry these kind of monkey rooms or monkey cabinets that were very popular in France in the 18th century, and they often uh, incorporate chinoiserie decor. Um, and uh, so no monkeys in this, this production, but we're also talking, some of you may have noticed um, affinities between the, the themes of this ballet and Beauty and the Beast, and also may have wondered, you know, one of the reasons why it's so appealing to the Met uh, and, and you know, to be connected to this inspiring Walt Disney show is the dancing teacups of, of Beauty and the Beast. And in fact, the um, 
The woman who originally wrote that fairy tale, Madame Villeneuve, was an associate of this circle, this amateur theater group that put on the Ballet de Porcelaine. And it was first um, published in 1740, so one year after the, the um, first performance of the Ballet de Porcelaine. And, and they were definitely interconnected. Um, and Phil and I are talking about uh, the possibility of you know, wanting to do something with Beauty and the Beast. So there will be some animals. Um, <laughs> <laughs> in that production if it if it moves forward. And was the original ballet ever performed? I think you spoke about this at the beginning of your talk, Meredith, but is there an original production? Yes, twice. Um, but you know, it was an amateur, it was what was called in, in, in France at the time a Théâtre des Sociétés. So not professional performers, although they seem to have worked with um, a choreographer from the from the Paris uh, Opéra, but it was performed at this aristocratic chateau, kind of a country house outside the city, at least once um, in the gardens, but, but really only twice. It did have a really interesting afterlife. Petit Pas seems to have known about it, and it inspired an, an intermezzo that he choreographed for Tchaikovsky's Queen of Spades. Um, so it kind of, and you know, there's the Beauty and the Beast connection. It crops up in a lot of different uh, later productions featuring animated or dancing porcelain. Um, but it's been almost 250 years since it has been performed. Um, and no one really talked about it or knew much about it at the time. So it's, it's really exciting to resurrect this lost work. There are lots of questions about details for the tour. So expect to see <laughs> lots of people at these events. Um, the next question asks, can you talk about the performance in Naples? I think it would be fascinating to see there in relation to the Chinoiserie porcelain rooms in Naples. Um, yes, in fact, you know, I mentioned they were a, an early supporter of the project, and it was partly because um, I had planned with Sarah Kozlowski, who directs a, related, a scholarly center there, um, supported by the Edith O'Donnell Institute for Art History. Um, we were going to do a two-day symposium there on porcelain rooms in a global context. And that's because it's this kind of early modern phenomenon of rooms decorated with hundreds of pieces of porcelain, either Asian blue and white porcelain or sometimes European porcelain. And Capo de Monte has one of the most exquisite surviving examples of these rooms that's made entirely with 3,000 interlocking pieces of Capo de Monte porcelain. And it's currently being restored. And so the kind of debut of its restoration is also going to uh, take place at the same time as the performances of the, the Belle de Porcelain there. Um, and then they're also reinstalling their porcelain collection. They have thousands of pieces of porcelain in storage that um, are going to be, you know, everything has been delayed a bit because of COVID. So I don't know if the timing is going to exactly overlap, but people who come to Naples might be able to also get a, a nice behind the scenes tour of the, the Salutino um, and to attend our, our symposium. There's a lot of scholar related scholarly events for people who want to kind of nerd out on, on the porcelain piece of it. Um, they can attend those, but the performances also will be. We'll, we'll be doing multiple performances at each venue um, that are going to be directed at different audiences. So some might be for school kids, some might be more for a kind of donor you know, event, some might be for, for scholars and, and also the general public. The next question will be coming from Jennifer Homans, our director. Um, first of all, I just want to thank you guys. This was fantastic. And I, and I just, you know, some of the things you were talking about, I was wondering about the connection between these porcelain figures and, you know, um, ideas of, of marble statuary and then later on the mechanical doll and these, these, these figures that are, and I, you know, some of the things you were talking about, Phil, as well as Meredith, you know, about the the, the nature of this material and the, the ways in which it relates to the kind of dance that you created, which is so beautiful and evocative, but also, you know, the muteness of dance and the muteness of these characters and the pantomime. I don't know, these are all just themes, you know, the sort of the, the, vo the voiceless person and the voiceless, but, but central, and, and human fragile, I, I, it, it just made, made me think of a lot of, of things that, you know, go around it. I wondered if you could just speak to that a little bit, either one of you or both of you. Yeah, I, I think part of that is like <clears throat> where, where this work is happening, right? It's happening in museums, it's happening amongst statues, um, but also it's happening where, um, 
you know, we, we, it might be on hard floors. So it's not like there's a lot of um, big jumping and, you know, big stuff. Sorry, Tyler, I know there's a little jumping for you, um, you know, because the pie god has to have his little legs, you know, um, but now you get it. Uh, so, so, you know, the, but this idea of um, being able to perform this fantasy where we are not dancers, we are, we, we suddenly are these living porcelain dolls. Um, that's actually like a character that we put on and, and there's a playfulness in the, the score. There's a, a, a sort of a, a prelude where uh, the two dancers come out as sort of contemporary people and they're, um, someone called it a little squid games, but they, they have these, these track suits that have these mice and track suits. Um, and it's sort of like we're saying like, hey, we're, we're the players, we're about to put on this show for you. And then because transformation is part of it, Harriet has made this magical transformation. So they, and then they, they become these characters. Um, and so there is this, uh, this element that we are, we are inviting people to look at us and we are going to play, play, play dolls for you. And we're going to reenact this doll fantasy for you, our, our audience tonight. So there's a little bit of that in the original that we're keeping and we're, we're trying to bring forward. Um, in the original also, just in terms of the, the tension between the past and the, the present, um, they, they closed with this big dance number and everyone sort of would have known the, the words. And, and so it was sort of like, and they would turn into a dance party. So it'd be sort of like if, if suddenly we just put on like, you know, like a Madonna song and like, all, you know, David Bowie's China Girl and all started like dancing around together. Like that was, that was the intended impact of the work at that time. And so obviously if we played the song that they would have danced around to, our audience wouldn't dance that way. So questioning, okay, so how do we, how do we make this for an audience today? That, that, that tension was also present in these spaces. I don't know if that answered the question. Anything to add, Meredith? No, that was perfect. All right, we are at time. Any last thoughts, Meredith, Phil, anyone? No, I just wanted to thank everyone for being here. And I see there's a lot of um, further questions and discussion in the chat about various decisions that we've made um, with regards to sort of deconstructing these these stereotypes. And I, you know, this is something that um, we're going to continue to be having conversations, you know, and dialogue along the way throughout the different performances. So jo join us on the the wild porcelain tour. Um, Phil at the beginning said something about porcelain sickness. That's actually a term from the period that Augustus the Strong used, that he had the porcelain sickness. He was so nuts about porcelain that he once traded you know, a whole regiment of soldiers for 150 Ming vases. So I hope, I hope tonight that we've kind of whetted your appetite for the historical aspects of the work as well as the contemporary ones. And you see like what a kind of capacious project this is. And it really also, we, we really, you know, COVID aside, we were really eager to bring real live, you know, audiences into this work to convey a sense of, of intimacy, um, to have this kind of shared experience. And so we can't wait to, to do that with as many of you who can join us. Um, so thanks again to the CBA for giving us this opportunity. And hopefully we'll actually, we can't, we can't see anybody in this webinar format, but hopefully we can see you in person soon. Coming, coming to a museum or a university near you soon. And thanks to Tyler and Shen for being here um, and also for their wonderful work all along the way. And thank you all for doing this. Wonderful.